the trial of your faith much more precious than tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. And so now ye see it not yet believing, ye rest with joy unspeakable and glory, giving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now I'm fixing to show you, fixing to show you what this verse means. I, let's read this again. I want everybody looking at the Bible. I want all you people looking either up on the screen. It's, I know it might be hard to read, but I want to get the Bible out if you can't. And I want you to read these verses. Verse 8. Whom having not seen. We've not seen Jesus Christ. The world says, you idiot, you people, you believe in somebody. God has never proved himself. You don't know that he really exists. You've never seen and yet you put all your faith in him. You be dumb idiot for believing that way. I was told that when I was in school. And I endured. I endured. I wasn't going to let anybody be in high school that my faith was. I withstood a, a psychology history teacher, psychology teacher, when she was going to teach. Sexuality was no longer a, a psychiatric disease the way it had been seen for years. And she was going to teach that it now is an accepted lifestyle. And I went home and I told my mom that she was going to teach on that. My mom called our preacher and our preacher called the school. And the next thing I know, I get called to the principal's office. Like, I guess, like I'm getting in trouble. And the principal said now... You know, at our church, we don't have a problem with teaching it as a subject. And what I wanted to say to Mr. Selinger in his, to his face was, there's a reason why I don't go to your church. I had a little cockiness in me back then. But I kept my mouth shut. And I remember not, not too long after that, the teacher got up and, and you could just see it in her face. She said, well, I was at this point going to teach on homosexuality and bisexuality, but there's been some complaints and so I'm not allowed to teach it. So we're going to move on to the next subject. You know... And here's dumb old me. I thought she was single because she was ugly. I did. I thought, who'd have her? She was a lesbian. She was a sodomite. Now, I'm not saying I've been the perfect example of fighting for the faith all my life. But I stood up to that one. I didn't think it was right then. I don't think it's right now. So you watch this. Verse 8. Who having not seen you love. In whom though now you see him not yet believing. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I want you to. I want everybody to look at this. Look at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, wait a minute. I thought you were saved already. You are. But have you received the end of that salvation? Are you in heaven yet? No, you're not. None of you are. Brother Lee is. Brother, help me with names, Lord. Wayne, I'm, I had a talk with my wife the other day about me remembering names. I do not, am I messed up again? I do not remember names. Keith. 
Keith is there. He's got it now. He's got the full end of his salvation. But Pam doesn't have it yet. She's got weight on it. I don't have it yet. I got to wait on it. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, turn there. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and, and of God resteth upon you, and neither on their party is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? House of God. If we don't learn this, how can the world learn it? And if the first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. He starts out by saying, beloved, in verse 12, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Young people, you're going to hit a place in your life that the devil has set up for you. He's already set up a net, a snare for you. And he's just waiting for you to walk into it. He's already got set up. Because he's going to try to destroy you. By the time you hit about 21, 22, 23 years old. And all of a sudden now, you're not going to church anymore. You're not listening to your mom and dad who are telling you, son, daughter, we're praying for you. We hope you get back in church. We hope you get, get back in right with God. You need to quit hanging around those guys that are drinking all the time. That medical marijuana card, you need to rip that up and throw that away. That, that, stuff's, that stuff's coming to these kids. Let's not play like it's not going to happen. Let's not pretend like it can't happen to any one of us here. Now, Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting to, that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham was tested, and did he pass the test? And I, I dare say that God would ever ask any one of us to offer up for death our own children. I dare say God would ever do that to any one of us. But I will tell you this. It was for love of my children that God helped me grow in grace and in faith. I didn't want to ruin their lives. James 1 verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The crown of life is when you finally make it to heaven, but you're not there yet, you, so you don't have it yet. None of you have it. Revelation 2.10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Then, unto, be faithful unto how long? Death. When do, you, when do you receive your crown of life? At death. Why? Because you made it through and remained faithful to the word of God. 
And God says, give that man a crown of life. Amen. Revelation 3.18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Let me, let me tell you what God's going to do to somebody, somebody in this church. God is going to take you and strip you bare. In other words, God's going to expose every wicked sin you commit. Who wants that? Who wants God to take them and strip them bare and show to the whole church what they've been doing? See, let me tell you something. I haven't told you publicly everything that, what did I call the guy from our radio station? Peter? I haven't told it publicly everything that he's done. But I can tell you that right now, Everything that he has done, he has been stripped completely bare and exposed for everything that he is. Michael, am I right? He's given me a thumbs up. And they've got him locked away in a prison that you would never be able to find. If you went to Kenya, you'd never be able to find it. They've got him locked up in a place that no one knows of. That's how serious they're treating this. Who wants that to happen to them? Can I tell you what they did to my Savior? Before they laid him down on the cross... They took his robe, his garment, and his loincloth off of him. And when they nailed him to that cross and raised that cross up, he was completely naked. So what does that have to do with anything? That is Christ bearing our shame. On the cross. Because na nakedness is shame, isn't it? What's the first thing Adam and Eve realized when they sinned? What's the first thing little kids, when they get to a certain age, do, all of a sudden you notice they don't want to run around the house naked anymore. Do you, you know what that is? That's a knowledge of sin. That to them is a knowledge that having all of this uncovered is wrong. And that's when they're, that's getting close to about the time when they're ready to start being, they need to be talked to about Jesus. Anyway, you got to move on. Now, everybody look up here. I call this, this is your life, okay? This is your life. And see, here's Egypt. Here's Egypt. And here's Canaan, heavenly Jerusalem, freedom from sin and death. Here's Egypt and its bondage to sin. Now, some people will always be Egyptians. You know what that means? They're always Never going to be saved. Never. And be honest with you. That could very well be somebody either sitting in this room today or listening to my voice right now. You're an Egyptian. You're going to stay an Egyptian and you are never going to heaven. Ever. 
God's going to destroy you, bury you at the bottom of the Red Sea. God's going to do that to you. Okay? So, let's say now that everybody that's right here is an Israelite. God's let us come out of Egypt. Well, because we were there working seven days a week, probably 18 hour days, making bricks for the Egyptians, building their cities, building their houses, building their huge monuments. We were in hard bondage. The Egyptians, they could kill us at a moment's notice. They didn't care about us. We could be killed. We could be whipped. We could be, we were told that we had to make bricks without straw. We had to go out and get our own straw. That's us being in bondage to sin. And every one of us, Brian, we all said, Oh, I want out of Egypt. I don't want to, I don't want to serve the Egyptians anymore. It's killing me. It's hurting my back. And I see my children, they're not getting to go to school. They're having to learn how to be slaves too. And I want out of this. So we all, when Moses shows up and says, Hey, who wants to leave Egypt and go to a land flowing with milk and honey? All of us say, Yeah, that's me. Amen. I want to go. Right? But how many of you are actually going to make it there? How many? Are some of you going to fall in the wilderness? Let me ask you a question. Did some of the people who left Egypt fall in the wilderness? Did they ever make it to the promised land? No. Now. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to show you that, that this is this teaching right out of scriptures. Okay? It's right out of the Bible. I would not preach anything to you. It's out of the Bible. Again, I want you to forget about... I want you to forget about uh, John Calvin, Jacob Arminius. I want you to forget... Well, once saved, always saved. I want you to forget about that. I want you to forget about, well, I believe you can lose your salvation. I want you to We can fight about the, is the earth flat. We can fight about this and that and the other. But what really matters is are you going to make it to Canaan land? That's all that matters. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. You know what that means? That's a picture of them being birthed, baptized. And, and we're, we're all baptized under Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat as us, they are no different. The Israelites are no different than us right here. That's what the Bible's telling you. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him. And that rock was Christ. 
And you sit there and say amen and say, Woo! Amen! Woo! Amen! And die and go to hell. And you wouldn't be the first. Wouldn't be the first. Verse 5, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Whose examples are they? Ours. That the, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You know what the hardest thing for me to not do is lust. It is not easy to not lust in this day and age. I don't care if it's another woman. I don't care if it's somebody's house. I don't care if it's. I don't. I, I don't care if it's a. Um, a box of. Um, Neko wafer candy. It's easy for me to lust. I'm just telling you who I am. So he said, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse 7, you know what the Bible says that Moses encountered when he came down from Mount Sinai the first time? That he looked down there and all of them were down there naked. All of them were. That's wicked. Neither be ye, verse 7, neither be ye idolaters as they were, as were some of them. And uh, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for our, our ensamples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And again you can amen me and flop your Bible up and down. And, and shout hallelujah and wave your hands in the air at something I preach. And die and go to hell. Now, this is your life. How many people left Egypt? According to Exodus 12, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men, beside children, and a mixed multitude went, all, went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So we're guessing approximately 2 million people left Egypt. 2 million people left Egypt. Out of those 200 million, how many made it into Canaan land? I've seen three people that knew the answer. Four people. Five. Who else knows the answer? Out of the two million people that left Egypt, how many of that group made it to Canaan land? Two. Joshua and Canaan. And that's it. You know when Jesus said straight is the way and narrow is the gate. 
and few there be that find it. He wasn't kidding, was he? The older that some of you guys live and have been in church, the more of the apostasy you, you have seen in your life. Am I, am I right? The more of the falling away have you seen, the more of the people that you have seen that served in church for a while and fell out, not because God called them to another church, but because they fell out because of lust, fornication, drunkenness, idolatry, you name it. Everything God said here, they fell out over it and left. And they ain't never coming back, ever. Never coming back. So my question is, is this your life? Because here is Egypt. Here is us on the journey to Egypt. Here's Canaan land, but we're not there yet. And let me show you some of the things the devil is going to throw in your path. Well, first thing he did was try to get them stopped at Mount Sinai. And God was ready to kill every single one of them. Remember that? And Moses, thank God for a mediator who stood between us and God and said, God, don't kill them. Take my life instead. I'll die in their place. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank God for a mediator who stood up for us and said, Take me, but save your people. That's Jesus Christ standing up for you. He loves you and he thinks you're worthy of it. Then... They complained at the waters of Meribah. Right here. God's mad at them again. Then there was the saying of Korah. I'll get into those later. Then there was the brazen serpent incident. 23,000 people died in one day. Then the ten spies coming back from here and telling everybody we can't go in there. That's wicked. And everybody at that time all 200 mil, or all 2 million of them said, let's make us a captain and let's go back to Egypt. Except for Joshua and Caleb. And because of that, they out of all these two million people, are the only ones who got to walk into heavenly Jerusalem, free from sin and death, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now all you young people, here you are, you left Canaan. And you're right here at the beginning of your real life, your adult life. And you're going to face every one of these and more. And some of you won't make it. It's just... I'm just telling you the statistics. We ran a Christian school for 12, 13 years. At one time had almost 70 students. 
And I can't tell you any of them who's serving God right now that I know of for sure. And I used to walk through those classroom offices, lay my hands on each one of them and pray over each one of them and used to say, God, make this school something that will take these young people and train them into glorious people for your kingdom's sake and let them be strong in faith. And that never really happened. Now, I believe God had a better plan. Because I know right now I'm teaching way more students online than I ever did here. So I'll take that. And when these families come to me and say, man, you ought to see our young ones. Every time that music comes on, they come running down. They want to hear what Pastor Mike says. That blesses my life. But I know those young people. I know that they can listen to that all throughout the time they get to 18, 19 years old. But when they hit this world of sin, every one of them has got to go through what every one of us went through. And, every and we know You see, everybody, this is your life. Okay? And I'm not going to read no more. I'm going to be done. This is your life. And over the next few Sundays, I'm going to preach some of these events. Remember, I'm from 50 years in your future. We do have flying cars. Okay? Now we have... COVID-75. We get a new COVID every year. Okay. I'm 40, 50 years from your future. And I'm here to tell you what's going to happen to each one of you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what, it, those of you who've already been through this, I'm going to tell you what happened and why it happened. And then you'll take and you'll go, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for bringing me through that. Thank you, God. You'll praise him that he didn't let you be Korah swallowed up. Amen. Let's all bow our heads. I'm going to give you a, a moment, a chance, if you want to, if you want to come down to one of these benches. You want to pray again? We already had one prayer. That was good. Didn't, wouldn't mind having another one, but let's, let's pray. Now, Father, we love you very much. I love you very much. I, my life, God, is right here. It's right here. I could have very easily fallen in every one of these events. But God, all I can say is you just didn't let me. That's all I can say. Is that you just didn't let 